Well, good morning. This is our second video looking at um, the introduction to Parliament. Um, in the, the first video, if I can just get my controls right. Um, in the first video, we went through the further reading you should be doing, the history of Parliament and how it kind of came to be. We talked about what parliamentary sovereignty actually means and talked about a term called fusion of powers, which I'll come back to um, in a second because it's something we need to talk about. We talked about the House of Commons, the House of Lords, how many people are in them and, and where they come from. We talked a little bit about where they sit and a different and what the difference is between the government and a backbencher and um, and what that means in terms of their roles. And I showed you this diagram here, which is one you might want to um, look at and, and think about to make sure that you, you understand. And then we talked about um, some actual parliamentary parts, um, people. We talked about backbenchers. We talked about the whips and what they do in, in, make, in, in trying to help MPs to vote the right way. Uh, we talked about the speaker. And we talked about the official opposition, and that's where we kind of come to here. Now, before I get on to uh, lawmaking and um, some of the other aspects of Parliament, I just wanted to revisit the, idea, the, the terms legislature, executive, and judiciary, because we have talked about these in a, in, in a very early lesson. But I want to just make sure that we understand these terms, because I've used the term, we are now learning about the legislature, the House of Commons. Um, but what exactly does each part do? I just want to clarify our understanding. The legislature is the easy bit. The legislature in, is the bit that makes laws. Their role is to vote yes or no on a law, and then that law either becomes law or not. They can do other little things like um, amend the law. So you know they can take it. They can take a piece of paper that looks that says this, and they can kind of say, well, actually, no, we think it should be this, and then they can do it. Um, they can debate the law as well. Um, they can do something that we call scrutinise the executive, which is a posh way of basically questioning the prime minister or questioning ministers and, and things like that. But basically their role is to pass judgment on laws in that they say yes or no, and then they also kind of look at the executive. I guess I guess there's kind of two roles, big roles there, but they're pretty easy to understand. It's the House of Commons and the House of Lords, they vote yes or no, blah, 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 blah. Let's go to the other side. The judiciary is also fairly, fairly straightforward because they interpret laws. So when there is a question about whether something is legal or not, that is when the judiciary comes into play. So uh, when um, Boris Johnson prorogued Parliament, there was a question about whether he could, whether that was legal or not, and they had to decide whether that was whether he whether he broke the law is the wrong phrase, but whether he overstepped his powers. There's a Latin term for that, which is ultra vires. Um, which we might look at later. The other thing they might do is if there are two laws which seem to be incompatible. So, for example, um, here's a real example. If the Human Rights Act says um, people are entitled to a fair trial, entitled to freedom, blah, 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 but then the government passes another law that says we're going to hold terrorist suspects, or the government doesn't necessarily pass a law, but they act in such a way, then the, ju ju the judiciary, I started on that one, the judiciary has to decide whether these two laws or actions actually kind of work together. Is that a legal action? Um, sometimes they might literally be two laws that seem to conflict, um, and so in which case the judiciary will make something called a declaration of incompatibility. And, and we'll come back to that later, we'll add more detail. But the judiciary's role is interpreting laws. Is that legal? Is that not legal? Do these two laws conflict in some way? So. That should be fairly straightforward. The, the slightly more complex one is the executive, because it changes a little bit from country to country. The simple version of the executive, as it says on the uh, slide behind me, is that they administer laws, i.e. they carry them out. So the legislature makes the law. So here we go, we're going to make a new law that says that the speed limit in this country is 60 miles per hour. And the executive then carries that out, so they will then instruct the police to arrest people or charge people that go above that. They will um, make sure that the speed cameras will catch people going kind of above that. They may well kind of publicize the fact that this is the new law in some way, but they, they, they kind of, the word administer means to kind of carry out um, that law. Um, I'm trying to think of another example off the top of my head. If, if, uh, oh, if, if the legislature raises taxes, then it is the executive that will enforce that tax raise and will collect that money. Um, and that was the original executive role. Um, now, administering laws, of course, also means that um, the executive is likely to be the commander-in-chief in terms of any kind of military action. In America, they actually do use that term, commander-in-chief. We don't really kind of use it here. But technically, the executive is also our, the ultimate military commander that kind of decides what our forces would do if we ended up in military action. 
Um, let's just make sure we're clear here. When we look in the legislature, we're talking about Parliament, and we're talking about the House of Commons, the House of Lords. In America, we're talking the House and the Senate. Who is the executive? It's the president or the monarch. It's the prime minister. It's the cabinet. Um, th these are the executive. Now, why is it slightly more complicated in the UK? Because in the UK, our executive also proposes laws. So the, the executive, which would be Boris Johnson and the cabinet, the, you know, maybe that front row of, um, of parliament, the House of Commons, will come along and say, we think there should be a tax rise, and they will send that to the House of Commons. The House of Commons will then debate that, they will discuss that, they will do a report on it, and then ultimately they will vote, vote, they will vote yes or no. And then the executive will then enforce um, that tax rise. So in, in, in the UK, the executive proposes laws and administers laws. There's a similarity in America in that the Donald Trump can say to Parliament, or, uh, to his Congress, sorry, uh, I want this to happen, I want to get rid of Obamacare, or I want to change this with tax rises. But then it's up to the legislature whether they actually want to debate that or discuss that. So the legislature is a lot more independent in America because of, key phrase, the separation of powers. Whereas in our system, we have that fusion of powers. Our executive, the prime minister, is the executive and in the legislature. So in our system, the executive is able to force the legislature to debate and to discuss and to vote and to report and to either say yes or no. The executive cannot actually force them to say yes to a law, but they can actually more or less force them to actually debate it and force them to vote upon it. And that is why we have this kind of fusion of powers. And because, and we'll talk about this again uh, later, and because actually the government, the, the prime minister and the cabinet and the, all of the junior ministers, if you add them all up, you've got about kind of 90 people in there-ish. The government nearly always has like a kind of 90 vote advantage on a law before anyone else even gets started um, in terms of the back benches. So I hope that kind of helps to clear up the definitions of legislature and executive and judiciary. Um, legislative is pretty straightforward, judiciary pretty straightforward, executive a little bit more complex, um, but just think of it in terms of like this. Um, I'm Boris Johnson, I want to make a law. I, the, there's a fusion of power, so I can say, right, I want to, let's say I want to uh, abolish private schools. So I propose this law because I'm Boris Johnson, I want to abolish private schools, and because there's a fusion of powers, I can force the legislature to debate it and vote on it. Um, and then the whole legislature will then vote. And then I will, let's say they vote yes to abolish private schools. Uh, as the executive, I will then enforce that. So I will go and I will actually close the private schools and I will make that sure that happens. And then someone might challenge that law and say, hang on, that's not legal because that breaks freedom of something or this or that. And then the judiciary would then have to decide whether there was two laws that kind of conflicted there or whether it kind of broke human rights or whether the government had overstepped its power. So that's kind of how the pattern and the route goes. Maybe in your notes, you might want to kind of draw that as a, as a little image or a kind of a timeline of, of how that um, might work. And maybe you could even draw out the difference between the American system and the UK system then. We might just put this in our seminar for, uh, for next week. Right, cool. Functions of Parliament. So what does Parliament actually do? I, I talked about this a little, a, a, a kind of a second ago, but I want to expand on it and I want to be a bit more detailed. The first one is a kind of a theoretical idea. It provides legitima legitimation. Mm -hmm. It's a word I always kind of struggle to say, along with legislature. But it basically provides the, the approval of the people for the laws. Because you and me, if you're old enough to vote, we vote for our local MP. Our local MP goes to Parliament to represent us, the area we live in, and, and, and us. And they will vote yes or no on certain laws, which provides legitimacy, public approval, for the laws that the government puts forward. And so the Commons, the Houses of Parliament, both of them together, were, initially, were initially originally put together to kind of give that approval or disapproval to certain laws. And the word we're going to use there is legitimation. Legitimation. You can also kind of phrase it as the legitimization of the government's policy, but legitimation is what we're talking about here. It's to provide the, the people's approval for, for certain laws or, or the opposite. And of course, if we're, if we're making laws, then that is literally called legislation. So in a way, we're providing the, legi legi the legitimation for the legislation. So you could even say that the legis legislature provides the legitimation of the legislation to make it legitimate, if you really want to kind of use it. But it, in each case, it's actually using the same kind of term, which is this idea of legitimacy, a, a real law um, with the approval of the people. Secondly, 
they provide scrutiny. When you scrutinize something, you look at something very, very closely. So here I am examining this um, exciting red pen that I found on my desk. Um, they also scrutinize the government. Now, that is a picture, a very small picture there, of Theresa May being interviewed by a, um, a large group of backbench MPs in something called the Liaison Committee. They get to interview the Prime Minister two to three times a year, unless you're Boris Johnson, in which case you only get once. Um, and uh, it is their job to interview the government, to uh, make a report on the government, to ask difficult questions of the government, to scrutinise, to look carefully at what the government is, is doing. Um, and we'll talk more about that in, in a future lesson, um, especially in regards to something called select committees, which is another version of committee that investigates what the government does. They also provide, and this links legitimation to, to representation, but they also provide representation for different political views, left wing, right wing, for different races, for different genders, for different sexualities, for different locations and regions in the United Kingdom, because obviously each one comes from a different place in the UK. And the idea is that everyone should feel that they have representation, people to talk on their behalf, campaign on their behalf, to be... Um, to be on their side um, in Parliament. There might always, not always be enough of uh, your particular representatives to, to get what you want to happen, but the idea is that everyone's voice should have a, um, a representative in Parliament. And one of the questions we'll be asking later is, do, how well does Parliament represent different views, different people, different attitudes, different demographics? Um, it's also a place for debate. Sadly, this isn't our House of Commons. This is one from, um, I think it's Eastern Europe, uh, where they actually ended up having a, an actual fist fight in the House of Commons. Um, but it is a place for debate. Um, perhaps less so these days. Like, the debates tend to be more kind of theatrical, as in they're not really debating it. They're just kind of going through the motions to kind of um, make, you know, try and get headlines on kind of TV or to try and kind of, it's kind of a bit of a kind of posing. Um, but it, theoretically, they are having a genuine debate. The reason why I'm saying is it genuine is because a lot of MPs just vote along party lines. I'm a Conservative MP, I'm going to vote with the government. I'm a Labour MP, I'm going to vote against the government. Like, a lot of the times the MPs aren't really thinking, hmm, am I going to vote for this bill to make it a law or am I not? Because they kind of know they're going to vote with their party. But in theory, there is a debate going on, and in theory the MPs are listening, and in theory the MPs are making a decision about whether they will vote for this or whether they won't. We definitely saw this with Theresa May on Brexit, when, when MPs were really voting very freely about what they liked and what they didn't like. Um, we've also seen uh, MPs voting freely on, on military action in the past. There are occasions where definitely the debates are real. Go back a couple of hundred years, the debates really are real, and MPs are really thinking, do I agree with this, am I not going to do this? And it, in some ways it's broken down. But in theoretically, the debates are um, genuine. And definitely a lot of time is given over in Parliament to that. This one's more unique to the UK. The other thing that the House of Commons is there for is to provide government. Because if you want to be Prime Minister or you want to be a minister, you, ha you have to be a member of the House of Commons first. So you have to become a, a local MP by being by being nominated by a local party and then you get voted in and then you become a member of the House of Commons and you are a backbencher and at some point, if you're lucky, someone will be like, I choose you and you will become a minister and you are now a part of the government as well as being still being an MP. And so the other role in our system is to provide the people to become the ministers. And here is Jacob Rees-Mogg, who was famously a backbencher for many years before being promoted to the government under... Um, Boris Johnson. doesn't necessarily happen in other countries, although it can do. I, uh, Donald Trump was never a member of um, his legislature, and, and you don't have to be in America. Like You can completely come in, into the government from, from other routes, from, from being an expert in healthcare, an expert in housing, and so on. But in our system, you have to be a, an elected representative first, on the whole. There, there are some exceptions to that. Um, and then you go into government from there. So that's what let me just go back there for a second. That is what uh, Parliament is supposed to do. So, so far in this video, we've talked about a clarification of the legislature and the executive. And we've talked about, well, what is the House of Commons actually supposed to do? We haven't necessarily talked too much about the technicalities yet. Um, but we've talked about kind of like broad brush strokes, like what is the role? Legislation, scrutiny, representation, debate, providing government. And put all those things together, it provides the legitimation of the people to what the government um, is doing, or maybe the disapproval of um, what the government is doing.
The last thing I'd like to do in this video, and this is going to be a bigger topic which will extend over this module, is how laws are actually made, the technical way, the route that it has to go through for a bill to become an act, or to put it another way, how a proposal becomes a law um, in Parliament. And this is going to involve both the House of Commons and um, the House of Lords, and there's some links that we can look at, and there's a video I'll, I'll show you at some point, and even a song that we can learn. Um, the first thing to say, um, looking at this diagram, or this um, illustration, is that a bill can start in either the House of Commons, or it can start in the House of Lords. It can, it can go, it can begin in either. That is not important. But whichever route it takes, it has to go through one, and if it makes it through one, it will then go through the other, you can, if you kind of follow the, uh, the chain along, and then uh, it will receive royal assent, and I'll come back to that in a second. Or if it starts in the House of Lords, it, and, it, and it goes all the way through, then it would go to the House of Commons, and then it would go for um, royal approval. So it can start in either, but in order for a bill to become an act, it eventually has to go through both. So what actually happens? You'll see that the system is both the same. If you just look at the House of Commons, House of Lords, the boxes here, can you see that there's 1, 2, C, R, 3? And if you look down here, we've got 1, 2, C, R, 3. And then it's the same as you go further on. So this is the process about what happens if it goes into um, whichever house it kind of starts in. First of all, let me grab a bit of paper to kind of illustrate this. I'll, I'll use my iPad because it's here. So here we go. This is my brand new uh, bill. This is my proposal. So let's say that Boris Johnson has just written this proposal for, to change the law on... Um, uh, environmental uh, renewable energy, uh, which is something I know he's, he's proposing recently. So here we go. Here is his bill on environmental energy. The first thing that happens is it has a first reading, which means it goes to Parliament and someone literally reads out the title and says that this is something that we are going to be um, debating. Um, it's then put in the calendar. Everyone knows it's going to happen. MPs might go and do some reading on it, maybe. Um, uh, part of their people might start to do some kind of research on it, maybe. But it's basically like an announcement. First reading is basically like an announcement. We will be doing this. Then there is a second reading, uh, which could come very, very quickly after the first reading. It depends how keen the government is to get it through, um, or it might be somewhere down the line. And then the government will, um, there will be, there'll be a bit more discussion now. We might have our first debate on the bill, and they will now be a vote. Um, and most bills will get through this vote at this stage, because this isn't the final stage. This is the kind of the general, yes, we approve that we will... Um, to kind of debate this one further, or we, 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 kind of, we kind of see where this one is going. Um, so that's called the second reading. So first debate, first vote. Then it goes to the committee stage. I mentioned committees in the previous video. I am going to be talking more about select committees in more detail. But basically, a committee stage is a smaller group of MPs, maybe, I think it's between 12 and 30. I need to check the exact numbers on that, but it's a small group. We'll get together, and they will look in detail at this particular proposal. And they will be backbench MPs, not members of the government. So not sitting on the front rows of the uh, of, of um, parliament. And normally these MPs will be will have expertise or a special interest in this particular bill or this particular area. They will they may well interview people that are involved in the bill. They might take evidence from the kind of people that this might affect. Um, they might um, discuss amongst themselves, they might do some research, they might talk to a think tank, they might talk to a pressure group, you know, let's call it a, like a research group, and then they will write a report, which is why we get the report stage, and they might send in their report, they might say, yeah, we recommend that you, we, we vote for this, they might say, no, no, we disagree with this, they might say, well, we like the bill, but we think you should change this, amend this, um, but actually the government doesn't have, in our system, the government doesn't have to take any of their um, suggestions on board. They might. They might kind of go, that's an excellent point. We completely agree with this change that you've come up with. Thank you. We'll take that on board. That that does happen. Um, at the same time, they might go, no, we really want this bill to go through as is. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to ignore it. But that committee stage is an important part of the scrutiny, that key word again, um, of what the House of Commons um, and the House of Lords do. So that's the committee stage and the report stage. The committee stage is when they are discussing it and finding out about it and taking interviews on it. The report stage is when they kind of give their report back to the House of Commons. And then finally we come to the kind of the ultimate moment, I guess, which is the third reading, which is when you have the final debate on it and the final vote. And if at that point the House of Commons or the House of Lords votes for the bill, it has passed that particular chamber, passed that house, passed that legislature. And then that bill is physically taken, and I do mean physically taken, from one house to the other house. So if it starts in the Commons, it goes from the Lords. If it starts in the Lords, it goes to the Commons. They carry it. Uh, you know, some guy wears his nice little suit and I think I think wig and ropes, and they carry it with a nice ribbon tied around it to the other house to say, here we go, this is here for your consideration. 
And then the process happens again, which, whichever is the other house. The, the committee stage is a little bit different, but it's, it's broadly speaking the same thing, and especially as this is our introduction. And then we go again, first reading, second reading, um, blah, blah, blah. Now, what happens if one house says yes and one house says no? Well, then they carry it back. And off they go back to the other house and they say, well, you know, do you want to think again about this? And then they might look at it again. And um, this time they might vote yes. They might listen to a, um, the amendments or they might continue to vote no. Um, but it could, in theory, go between the houses repeatedly. And the nickname for this is ping pong, like a game of tennis. Ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Politically, re political reality, it doesn't happen very often. You occasionally get like a ping pong ping. Um, and I'll talk about that when I talk about the House of Lords. Um, but theoretically, a bill could go back and forth. If one house is really keen to say yes and one house is really keen to say no, it could go back and forth until they um, can, can agree in some way. Um, and the process for that is what we're calling here is the consideration of amendments. You see that at the end where you've got the A. Um, so we're looking at the amendments, we're looking at any changes, we're looking at kind of disapproval. But if a bill eventually gets through both houses, it then goes to royal assent, which is basically a posh way of saying the Queen signs it, or the monarch, if that happens to be a king. Um, and uh, that bill is then taken to them, and when the, the head of state, there's a kind of posh word for the Queen, uh, when the head of state signs it, it is then officially um, law. It's the same in the American system. The, the, the legislature will, will vote on a, a bill, which then becomes law, and then it is taken to the head of state, who is the president, and the president will then sign it. Sometimes in America they actually have a, a signing ceremony. So say when, uh, when Obama did Obamacare, which was his kind of version of the NHS. He then had a big signing ceremony. He got people there from both houses to come along. He got some people that were going to be fed by it. He got a big crowd, lots of people photographing it. He proudly signs the law, um, uh, sorry, signs the act, which then makes it a law. Um, our Queen doesn't do that. It's all kind of done privately. But it is, it is still her signature that technically makes it a law. And um, what was I going to say? And, and yeah, we, we have a constitutional monarchy in our system, which means the Queen has technically still has these powers but in political reality she doesn't use them you know it's more of a kind of a ceremonial thing her signing it um, but there's a really cool play called Charles the third where they ask the question what would happen if the monarch refused to sign a law and they kind of make up this scenario where um, Prince Charles doesn't agree with a law and so he refuses to sign it and uh, what kind of happens, and it creates a bit of a constitutional crisis. And it's a good question, you know, what would happen if the king, king or queen didn't sign it? Um, because technically speaking, by convention, that means it's not a law, but politically reality, the, the queen, king or queen has no power. Um, I don't have the answer to that one, I've gone slightly off topic, but something for you to kind of think about in terms of our slightly unusual relationship of having a monarch, but not really having a monarch. Uh, it, it puts us in a, in a slightly kind of weird pattern. Um, and I'll talk about that one another time. So there you go. That is our introduction to Parliament. So you should now know, broadly speaking, the history of Parliament, how it, how it came to be. You should know some of the different bits and parts of Parliament, uh, the people that are in there. You should know, um, if I talk to you about parliamentary sovereignty, you should be explained what that means, including that word omnicompetent. You should be able to tell me what a backbencher is and what their role is, a whip is. You should be able to tell me um, what the House of Commons actually does like it, its different roles. You should be able to, to explain the difference between the common, the legislature and the House of Lords. Sorry, the legislature and the executive and the judiciary. Whew. And you should be able to tell me how laws are made. There's a lot of information um, in this video, so go and make sure you do your reading, solidify it, come with any questions, get ready for our seminars, and I'll see you next week because you're awesome and so am I.